It's the Real News Network. I'm Sharmini Pires coming to you from Baltimore. On Wednesday, President Trump announced that the United States will recognize Venezuelan opposition leader Juan Guaido as the legitimate president of Venezuela. President Maduro, in response, announced that he is cutting off diplomatic ties and the embassy's diplomatic staff has 72 hours to leave the country. Al presidente de la República, el general Cipriano Castro, el imperio norteamericano le organizó un golpe de Estado para apoderarse del petróleo de Venezuela desde el propio inicio del siglo XX. All this was triggered shortly after Juan Guaido, who is the president of the National Assembly in Venezuela, swore himself in as the president. Juro. Asumir formalmente las competencias del Ejecutivo Nacional con el presidente encargado de Venezuela. Now, Juan Guaido uh, swore himself in on the claim that Nicolas Maduro, the current president of Venezuela, is illegitimate and that given that the president and the vice president is illegitimate, that he is the next in line for the presidency. Yesterday, Vice President Mike Pence set the stage for all of this by making an announcement directed at Venezuelans, urging them to rise up against President Maduro. On behalf of President Donald Trump and all the American people, let me express the unwavering support of the United States as you, the people of Venezuela, raise your voices in a call for freedom. Nicolas Maduro is a dictator with no legitimate claim to power. The United States joins with all freedom-loving nations in recognizing the National Assembly as the last vestige of democracy in your country, for it's the only body elected by you, the people. As such, the United States supports the courageous decision by Juan Guaido, the president of your National Assembly, to assert that body's constitutional powers, declare Maduro a usurper, and call for the establishment of a transitional government. Now, leading up to all of this, tens of thousands of Venezuelans had taken to the streets of Caracas on the 61st anniversary of the overthrow of Venezuela's last dictator, Marcos Perez Jimenez. Now, supporters of President Maduro also took to the streets because this is an annual event that both sides or, you know, just Venezuelans in general come to uh, celebrate. But, uh, but these demonstrations, and particularly the opposition demonstration, uh, was manipulated to make it look like that these were large protests uh, demonstrating the overthrow or, or desire to overthrow Nicolas Maduro. Now, what is happening in Venezuela is, of course, the topic of this discussion. And joining us from New York today is Alex Main. He's the director of the International Policy uh, Department uh, at the Center for Economic and Policy, uh, Center for Economic Policy Research in Washington, D.C. And also joining me here in our studio is Gregory Wilpert. He is our managing director, managing editor here at The Real News. And uh, he's also the author of Changing Venezuela by Taking Power. Gentlemen, I thank you both for joining me. My pleasure. Thank you. All right, Alex, let me start with you. Uh, you work for CEPER, uh, directing policy, so you have a lot of hands-on experience in Washington in terms of trying to uh, make sense of the uh, foreign policy of the U.S. 
towards Venezuela. And there has been some strategic efforts here uh, on the part of the U.S. to cripple Venezuela's economy, uh, to, of course, organize the region against Venezuela. Uh, give us a sense of uh, the strategies that the U.S. Uh, government, the Trump administration in particular, has been up to in uh, recent months? Well, this administration has been deploying a number of strategies over the last few years. And um, really, they sort of support uh, an ongoing strategy of regime change in Venezuela that we've seen for a very long time, uh, starting with the George W. Bush administration. And, and really, it continued uh, to a great extent under the Obama administration, though perhaps not quite as overtly, and it's become, again, very overt um, under President Trump. And particularly since uh, August of 2017, when he put into place uh, economic sanctions uh, that have literally starved uh, the economy of a much needed uh, international funding uh, at a time when the economy, of course, has been in uh, a serious crisis. Uh, so it, it's reminiscent of the sort of U.S. policy that we saw towards Chile in the early 1970s when uh, I think it's Kissinger who famously said, you know, we're going to make, it was Kissinger and Nixon who said, we're going to make the economy scream. Um, and certainly the economy of Venezuela has been screaming. Uh, it, uh, it has to do a lot with, you know, some of the flawed economic policies of the Maduro government itself, but uh, it's uh, really grown much worse since these sanctions were put into place. And then there's been a lot of talk of military inter intervention and of coups uh, from people both within the administration, uh, such as former uh, um, Secretary of State Rex Tillerson, uh, and people very close to the administration who've had a great deal of influence on Venezuela policy, such as Marco Rubio, who have entertained the idea of, of a coup to, to solve Venezuela's problems, um, so to speak. And... Um, now we're seeing a strategy of, of complete non-recognition. Really, to be fair, uh, this administration had never really recognized uh, the Maduro government. Um, you know, af after the elections that took place uh, that first elected um, Maduro, the Obama administration, of course, uh, hadn't really recognized the results and it sort of follow and followed the, uh, the, the hardline opposition in not recognizing the results of those elections. Then they sort of learned to live with the government, but now they are coming out saying that they no longer recognize the government as being legitimate. And I think what what's very clear is that, you know, with all these threats, with the sanctions and so on, um, they're really trying to find breaches within Venezuela's armed forces. Um, really, they are seen sort of as the arbiter. Unfortunately, they're seen sort of as the arbiter of um, you know, political outcomes in Venezuela today. And I think there's a, a very concerted effort to try to provoke um, the armed forces into supporting uh, this, you know, newly heralded uh, opposition leader who was unknown until really just a couple of weeks ago. Um, and of course, you know, there are reports uh, that came out um, earlier last year that uh, very senior level Trump administration officials had been meeting with dissident uh, Venezuelan army officers uh, and, you know, ones that had, were very clearly seeking support for uh, uh, a military coup. So I, I think that's what's happening here. And, and we'll have to see. I mean, to date, the, the armed forces, or at least the bulk of the armed forces, and certainly the high command of the armed forces of Venezuela, has, um, uh, you know, not not wanted to get involved in this way in in politics, and hopefully that will remain the case. Um, uh, but obviously, they're under a tremendous amount of pressure this time. All right, Greg. Now, um, uh, for those who are just joining us and wasn't a part of the previous uh, live stream we had done on Venezuela as this news broke, um, give us a sense of what are some of the events that has taken place in the recent past that has led to this uh, situation today. Well, first of all, as Alex mentioned, the <laughs> efforts to overthrow uh, both the Chavez government and then the Maduro government go way back. At, uh, and, of course, the, found its most important expression in the 2002 coup attempt against Chavez. 
Uh, but more recently, uh, these efforts, of course, have intensified, and I, I assume that the reasons they've intensified are several fold. Uh, first, there was the death of President Chavez, and that uh, certainly looked like an opening for the opposition and for the U.S. government to overthrow the government. Um, and that's when they organized massive protests already, and during that, or right after that election. Then um, the economic crisis, the decline in oil prices, misguided economic policies on the part of the Maduro government that led to hyperinflation, uh, led, I think, to the sanctions that uh, further intensified the economic situation. And then, of course, we also have, uh, from a couple months ago, the uh, attempt, assassination attempt using uh, bombs on drones uh, that uh, attacked a, a Maduro during a military parade. And uh, that, uh, you know, was foiled, but uh, that was the clearest indication yet of the efforts to overthrow uh, Maduro. Uh, he himself later on went on to say that more attempts will be coming, and he specifically identified Mike Pence and uh, John Bolton and Marco Rubio as being behind these efforts. Um, and this was then shortly later, I think, uh, confirmed with uh, both of their, that is, uh, uh, Pence's and Bolton's trip throughout Latin America, uh, where they toured various governments and put pressure on them to turn against Venezuela. Um, not that they needed much pushing, considering that they visited mostly conservative governments. The, uh, of course, uh, Ecuador, I think, was an interesting exception that, at least for a while, wasn't considered conservative, but now should be considered part of that conservative camp. And uh, then um, we also had uh, some uh, interesting events that showed fractures within the uh, security apparatus of the Venezuelan government. First, uh, the kind of uh, uh, arrest of uh, the opposition leader, uh, Juan Guaido, uh, which turned out to be a fake arrest. Uh, they, uh, Guaido himself said that they were actually sympathizers of his, uh, and uh, they immediately let him free and were basically telling him to, to do something, basically. And uh, then the... Um, then uh, the uh, the incident uh, of uh, National Guard uh, uh, soldiers basically trying to steal weapons. Uh, 27 of them ended up being arrested. This happened just yesterday. So we had a number of different incidents that really led up to this. Uh, although I think, um, and we knew that already Juan Guaido, when he first took office of the National Assembly, he said that uh, he was basically intending something like this, that uh, he wasn't recognizing Pre um, President Maduro as the legitimate president president of Venezuela and already suggested that uh, something like this would be coming sooner or later. I think what took people so by surprise more than anything, although we saw warning signs for this as well, was the uh, recognition by the U.S. government by, uh, and uh, by the OAS uh, secretary general and now a whole bunch of other uh, conservative governments in the region that uh, Maduro is not uh, the legitimate president Juan Guaido, according to them, is. All right, Alex, uh, give us a sense of uh, the kind of support that the opposition in Venezuela and I guess Juan Guaido in particular are getting from the uh, international community, at least in the region. Now, U.S. Uh, has, of course, uh, endorsed his, uh, him swearing himself in as the president, as I said earlier. But at the same time, we have countries that in the past may have uh, remained neutral in the situation in Latin America, uh, coming forward and endorsing uh, Juan Guaido, um, and this is very surprising, particularly coming from Canada, from Ecuador. Um, you know, we're not surprised with Bolsonaro in Brazil, given that, you know, he and uh, the Trump administration has uh, already declared an affinity with each other in terms of uh, uh, the region. But but uh, what do you make of the support that uh, Juan Guaido is getting from the region? Well, on the one hand, uh, you know, as Greg was pointing out, there are a lot of conservative governments out there now in Latin America. There's been a, been a big swing to the right, uh, and you have right-wing and far-right-wing governments, um, such as in Brazil, uh, that are completely aligned, really, with the U.S. strategy of regime change in, in Venezuela. And, and so it's a geopolitical context that you know, is very difficult for Venezuela at the moment. It has, it has uh, very few allies. Um, but, you know, what is surprising to me is to what extent they're ready to um, accept uh, such an intense level of intervention in internal politics. Uh, because traditionally um, in Latin America, 
there's been a very strong reticence to that sort of thing. And, and coming, obviously, from uh, the history of U.S. intervention in the region. And, and so there's, there's been actually, and I think uh, the case of Cuba is uh, sort of emblematic of that, of how Latin American governments, both on the right and the left, um, have been very much opposed to the U.S. strategy of regime change in Cuba for a very long time. Um, so it's surprising to see them to go quite this far in the case of, of uh, Venezuela. But I think, I think it has something to do with the fact that Venezuela is um, not just an outlier in, in, you know, in political terms in the region now, but is a country that represents a real threat to the right regionally uh, to the extent that if, um, if they recover economically, um, if oil prices go up again, um, it can become once again a regional powerhouse as it was under Chavez and can have a great deal of influence politically um, around the region. And, uh, and of course, you know, Venezuela was a real leader in the sort of pink tide of left governments that emerged um, in the early 2000s. And, that were quite strong until you know 2009, 2010, and so I think uh, I think what's going on in, in part is a real fear that uh, Venezuela could make a comeback, so to speak. At the moment, they're really crippled economically. Uh, I mean, they're in a very, very difficult situation that the U.S. has made much more difficult, and um, you know, no other countries have imposed these sorts of economic sanctions against Venezuela, but of course. Uh, since you know most of uh, international financial institutions, um, private and public, work through the United States, uh, the United States sanctions have a tremendous amount of effect. Um, so anyway, yeah, I'm uh, on the one hand not surprised; on the other hand, to a certain extent, surprised that they would accept this level of intervention. It set, sets a really bad precedent, and of course, uh, it violates international law. It violates the OAS Charter to interfere to this. Uh, extent in the internal politics of uh, another country. All right, uh, Greg. Now, there's been tremendous internal economic strife on the people of Venezuela for the last five, almost six years now. And uh, this could lead the people, I mean, the discontent is so great that the people would uh, tend to support any change. Um, even legitimate or not, but, you know, people are suffering. Um, now, what can the government do? I mean, we have to actually face the fact that a lot of this uh, economic strife could have been evaded by the government if they had introduced certain economic policies sooner uh, and addressed the problem more head on. So if you were advising the government, what would you be saying to them? Well, actually, I mean, this is kind of an issue that we discussed here on another report in The Real News um, with Mark Weisbrot, um, who points out that the current sanctions on Venezuela make it very difficult to uh, do a course correction. Um, not impossible, but extremely difficult. Um, and the big problem is that Venezuela, um, that I think the, the Maduro government did not uh, implement a sensible exchange rate policy. So it created a tremendous amount of, of opportunity for corruption. And um, when the political crisis hit, there was a tremendous amount of capital flight, which cre increased, it created a huge gap between the official exchange rate and the black market exchange rate. And this led to uh, incredible opportunities for, for corruption in Venezuela. And that problem was never really fixed. The government has tried various economic reforms, but none of them really went far enough to actually address this uh, or resolve this fundamental problem. And uh, so that's that's kind of the heart of the, the economic problem, in my opinion, and I think in the opinion of many other economists who have looked at this. Um, but uh, right now, they're facing, on top of this economic problem, uh, this uh, uh, political problem, this geopolitical problem, really, uh, which could lead to actual civil war-like situation. I think we have to be very clear on this, and that's why I think, um, regardless of what you think of what the Maduro government has done economically or politically, um, 
Um, it cannot, it's, one should not allow it to come, things to come to this situation where a civil war actually begins. That is, um, where, as uh, Alex mentioned, there's this hope on the part of uh, the uh, Trump administration and of the radical opposition. One should keep in mind that there's also moderate opposition that does not uh, pursue this particular course of action, as actually has not endorsed Guaido as uh, the president. But uh, this radical opposition and the Trump administration are pursuing a course where they're hoping for a military uprising that uh, would completely destroy the country and uh, would would put uh, everyone's lives at da in danger, and the U.S. bears a tremendous or bears all the responsibility uh, for uh, for uh, this kind of situation if if it were to come to pass. All right, Alex. Now um, uh, the Trump administration seems to be very clear on where they are at. Where is Congress, uh, Congress and Senate? Are there members within uh, these bodies that might take? a position, uh, a different position than the Trump administration? And is there any hope that there is dissent in terms of endorsing uh, Guaido in this way? And is there uh, anything that Congress can do? Doesn't some of this actually uh, responsibility for this kind of foreign policy lie uh, on the part of Congress? Well, uh, to the, the extent that the Trump administration um, is uh, you know engaging in sort of illegal, uh, illegal under uh, international law, illegal intervention. Um, you know the Congress should try to serve as a check to that, and um, you know hold the government accountable. Unfortunately, um, most of the leadership of Congress, uh, I think, is really just about as bad on Venezuela, and um, this is for a variety of reasons. Uh, but I think. You know, one of the main ones is that uh, they, there's no pushback um, from any sectors. Uh, certainly, a lot of the Venezuelans that uh, are here in the U.S., the diaspora, are uh, very often favorable to U.S. Uh, intervention. Um, and, you know, it's also the impact of Florida politics, where um, for a very long time, um, and unfortunately continues to remain the case, uh, the uh, essentially the very conservative um, Latino uh, sectors that you find in in South Florida and in other parts of the country, such as to a more limited extent in, in New Jersey, for instance, uh, they have an enormous influence on certain members of Congress. And these members of Congress tend to um, congregate in the uh, House Foreign Affairs Committee and the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, uh, where, of course, they have a lot more leverage over um, U.S. policy in Latin America. Um, and so, you know, the priority for these sectors has been traditionally uh, regime change in Cuba, but it's shifted more and more towards Venezuela, in part because Venezuela has seen, um, I think, uh, mistakenly as propping up uh, the Cuban government somehow, um, but also because, uh, again, uh, because of Venezuela's uh, enormous potential regional influence as an oil power. Uh, so, you know, they, they really have a bullseye on Venezuela, and they have had for a very long time, and they've played a very big role in, in shaping policy. Now, you do have uh, certain progressive sectors that have opposed um, really both Obama uh, and Trump on certain policies towards Venezuela, and particularly sanctions, um, which they've quite rightly identified as harmful to ordinary Venezuelans, uh, but also, um, you know, having a polarizing effect uh, in Venezuela and on Venezuelan politics, and, and sort of serving to bolster the more, more hardline forces on both sides of the political divide, and uh, thereby really undermining efforts uh, to carry out dialogue. And, and there have been efforts um, that have been scuttled in the past by hardline sectors with support from hardliners such as Senator Marco Rubio. Um, and there are new efforts that are underway. And unfortunately, the position that the U.S. is taking uh, and that, of course, Brazil has followed and Canada has followed and now Ecuador as well, um, uh, risk, you know, further polarizing things politically. Uh, certainly, there are is a risk of civil war, particularly if there is uh, a real breach within the armed forces. 
uh, and you know it's, that that could occur, and things could get very violent, very ugly, and um, they would have very detrimental effects, not just for the people of Venezuela, but really you know regionally in Latin America, it would certainly have spillover effects. Uh, Greg, um, what is the responsibility of the military now? Uh, a lot rests with the military and how they will act. In the past, they have uh, acted, opted for keeping peace and uh, the least amount of violence possible. Um, do you think that will be the case? Well, it's very hard to say. As I said in the previous segment, um, that uh, I think it uh, varies, of course, according to rank, uh, where I think the generals will t probably hold with Maduro, but uh, we're, what we don't know, the big unknown, is whether the mid-level and lower officers will uh, perhaps organize something against Maduro. It's just impossible. There are just too many of them. It's too difficult to know what everybody's thinking. Uh, and they're also suffering from the economic crisis, and so some of them might be motivated because of that. Plus, they're not benefiting uh, from, uh, with so many of them are actually are benefiting from corruption, but some of them don't because they don't have access to the, those kinds of benefits, or others might not care uh, and say that, well, we can make even more money under a corrupt opposition government, uh, which is definitely a possibility. So we just don't know what's going to happen to those. I think that's where, that's the, really the big question. But the main thing, I think, really, is that uh, the opposition really needs to come to the, its senses in Venezuela and negotiate with the Maduro government. The gov Maduro government has offered to negotiate with the opposition. As a matter of fact, as I said, there's moderate opposition figures who have offered to negotiate as well. And um, and I think the government, though, also needs to make real compromise. I mean, in the sense that uh, it needs to recognize how dangerous the situation is. I think Maduro cannot believe, uh, should not uh, just blithely believe that everything is going to be fine. This is a very, very serious situation at the moment, I think. And uh, that means in order to prevent bloodshed, it means actually conceding something to the opposition. That's my opinion. Because um, if they don't, uh, we we could get into, like uh, Alex and I have said, into a civil war situation. What does that look like, conceding to the opposition? It's hard to say. I mean, it could even involve another presidential election, perhaps. Um, uh, I mean, something like that, something dramatic. I know that sounds crazy for some people on the Chavista side to contemplate. Um, but uh, and, but it would have to be a managed transition, um, in which it would be, I think, if there is an election, uh, even if the opposition were to win. It would not mean a total loss of power. They still have many other institutions. Uh, it would be something a managed transition, uh, whereas if uh, the course that the, the radical opposition and the course that the Trump administration is seeking is a complete break. Uh, they want to get rid of, uh, wipe Chavismo off the face of the earth, and that would uh, probably only happen with bloodshed. And uh, that's why I'm saying, uh, in order to prevent that, it would mean uh, a, 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 a compromise uh, that has to be made by the government. All right, Alex, let me give you the last word. As far as Washington is concerned, and if there are people in Congress that wants to evade bloodshed and, uh, and this worsening of the situation in Venezuela, uh, what should happen now? Well, you know, more people need to be paying attention in Congress because, like I said, unfortunately, they've allowed um, sort of radical right-wingers with a radical interventionist agenda in Latin America to have the upper hand in the, in the discussion on Latin America and to really shape the uh, policy agenda. And so there just needs to be more involvement of progressives. They, they should have been more involved earlier, and they have spoken out occasionally. Um, but really, uh, what we're seeing now, uh, you know, there was so much support for the normalization effort of Obama that came from the bulk of Democrats and, and even a number of Republicans. Um, and that was obviously rational, reasonable policy. And yet we're not seeing that in the case of Venezuela. Um, people have turned a blind eye. They just haven't felt any need, any pressure to do so. Uh, but we're seeing a real conflagration, uh, you know, a, a, a situation that could become a huge problem ultimately for the United States. Uh, you destabilize Venezuela, you um, end up destabilizing, frankly, a big part of the region, certainly the Andean region. And that's something sh that should be of concern and, and members of Congress should want to preempt, um, you know, the what we could really characterize as destabilization tactics that are being employed by the, the Trump administration. 
All right, we here at The Real News will continue to have this discussion about what's unfolding uh, in Venezuela and what can be done about it. I've been speaking with Alex Main. He's the Director of International Policy at the Center for Economic Policy and Research in Washington, D.C. And I've been speaking with our um, uh, editor, managing editor here at The Real News Network and his book, uh, changing Venezuela by taking power is to be noted in this situation. Um, I thank you so much for joining us, both Alex and Greg. Thanks. Thank you. And we'll continue this discussion tomorrow here on the Real News Network. So do join us. And thank you for joining us.